Hey, everyone. Hey everyone, um, this is Tom Beck from Soda and, uh, and Kristen Bell from Adobe. Uh, apologies for uh, the, the late start. We had a technical issue with getting the uh, live stream uh, to go live, uh, I think, which is an important part of live streaming, I guess. So anyway, we're here now and we appreciate you uh, joining us today. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Hi, again. And, uh, <laughs> while, we, while we work through that. Uh, so try this again. So this is uh, the Soda Series Live, and it's a collaboration between the Adobe XD team and Soda, the Society of Digital Agencies. You met Tom here on the screen. Um, I'm Kristen Bell from the Strategic Development Team at Adobe. Our goal with these sessions is to uh, help keep you informed of some of the latest trends and topics helping to shape and influence the creative industry. And we partner with uh, super innovative agencies from within the SOTA membership uh, to have these conversations. And today we're excited to uh, talk with the folks from Column 5. So we'll introduce them in just a second. Um, but Tom, for those who are not familiar with SOTA, maybe give us a little bit of information on your organization and, and what you're all about. Yeah, for sure. So SOTA is a, is a global community for digital agency founders, uh, owners, and leadership teams. Uh, we've been around since 2007, uh, and we have about 100 member agencies spanning 20 countries. Uh, and the really focus and mission of, of SOTA is to um, help these leadership teams, help these founders, help these owners uh, be more connected to resources, ideas, uh, peers, and programs that really can help them grow their business, um, make a bigger impact uh, on the on the market, and you know just continue to to create and grow a wonderful agency culture. Uh, and we've been thrilled to you know partner with Adobe since actually the very beginning of the organiza yeah. organization. So um, Adobe has been part of the Soda community since two thousand seven, and um, it's been a it's been a wonderful ride over these last 13 or 14 years, and we're thrilled to be here today on the Soda Series Live. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Tom. Adobe has been honored to um, be a founding partner and just support the creative industry as a whole. So as part of that, uh, we're super excited to bring these conversations to the community. And um, to get us started, I would like to introduce Talon Wadsworth, a principal designer here at Adobe and founder, one of the founders anyway, of Adobe XD. Um, so thanks for joining us for this, Talon. Oh, thanks for having me, as always, Kristen and yeah. Tom. Pleasure to see you. Love it. And um, Tom, would you do the honors of introducing our guests? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're thrilled to rec uh, welcome Ross Crooks and Asher Rumack from Column 5. Um, Ross is one of the, the co-founders of Column 5, along with his two partners, um, Jason uh, and Josh. And they launched the business in about 2009. Uh, based in Irvine, California, and uh, New York, and I've known had the good good fortune of knowing uh, Ross within the Soda community for about the past five years. Uh, and Asher, who I'm just meeting uh, this week for the first time, Asher is the director of brand and strategy at Column Five, uh, and is it has been there since the very early days, uh, about eight years now. And you know we're thrilled to have these two join us today. Uh, talk a little bit about content design, content marketing, brand, authenticity, um, organizational design as it relates to um, purpose and autonomy and collaboration and a whole host of other great topics that pop up today. Um, before we get started, I just, uh, I'm going to turn this over to, um, to Talon, Ross, and Asher. But um, Kristen and I will be interacting within the LinkedIn comment stream. So if you have any questions or comments along the way, please uh, let us know. Uh, you can either message us directly or just post right in the right in the comment stream, and we'll have maybe ten or fifteen minutes for questions near the end of the call. 
Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it back over uh, to the to the crew here and uh, have a great conversation today, guys. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the other end. Great. Thanks, Tom. All right, Ross Asher. Good, Hello. good afternoon already, I guess we could say there on the East Coast. Um, great to great to see you both. Uh, nice to meet you as well. This is for the first time. Um, thanks for being with us. Yeah, excited to be able to chat. Thanks for having us. This is this is the best way I like to spend my mornings. Of course, I'm on the, on the West Coast, basically talking to other creatives and really kind of getting into the weeds about design and about process and all that stuff. So let's let's just like dig right into it. Um, so like let's get let's set, let's set the stage here. Let's give everybody a little backstory. Uh, can you tell us how Column Five came to be, Ross? Like, like how how did you how did you start this whole thing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was it was uh, to be honest, a bit of a happy accident. Um, but my co-founders, as Tom mentioned, uh, Jason and Josh, we were college buddies, and um, just kind of working to figure out what we wanted to do post post college. And I actually started a, a clothing line, like a men's apparel line, with my partner Jason, uh, or my current partner Jason. And we were working on that and Josh was simultaneously uh, building a little clothing boutique and he was, um, so he was sort of doing that. So there was some, some kind of synergy there and we were, you know, working together a bit on a few things and I was working out of the back of his store, um, you know, during the day. So we got to kind of collaborating on some things. And one of the things that we started to do was um, we started a little blog to be able to create some content and kind of cross promote our companies and be able to you know promote our friends companies and that sort of thing so it was just kind of like a little uh lifestyle music art design kind of everything we thought was cool kind of blog um and so we started creating a lot of content for that you know writing up everything from you know reviewing a live show music show to like the latest you know, sneaker collaboration or whatever it was, right? So we just kind of started creating a bunch of content, trying to build up some some audience for what we were doing. And, um, and in doing that, we were really trying to find ways to drive traffic to that site, right? How are we gonna get people um, viewing this? And so at the time we were, we were kind of exploring some of the social news sites of the day, which this is like 2007, eight, nine. Um, so it was like, you know, Reddit and dig.com was a big one at the time mm -hmm. and stumble upon and some of these sites. So we started to kind of explore those communities and become part of those communities and figure out what people wanted to see. Um, and so we got really good at creating content that was interesting to these groups of people and, um, and could bring a lot of traffic to our site. And so, you know, those days it was, you know, we'd create a post and they would go up, get on Dig's front page and it would take down our site because we <laughs> didn't have the server infrastructure or whatever. But um, so we kind of figured that out and, and started exploring that and having some success there. And we never really figured out how to monetize that. Um, but what happened was kind of the people that were early in content marketing in the startup um, world that were trying to be scrappy and figure out how to drive traffic to their sites kind of saw us succeeding at that and we're looking for help um you know driving traffic and creating interesting content for their their own um brands well, that's really fantastic. Really fantastic yeah so so we sort of accidentally created an agency um doing that and uh, and started creating content for brands and figuring out how to drive traffic and bring um you know bring build audiences um and in doing that, one of the things that we really noticed and, and kind of how we um, how we started to get a little bit of traction in the market was um, at the time, a lot, in a lot of those communities, people were kind of geeking out on these old infographics, right? They were mm -hmm. seeing, um, scanning it old encyclopedias or they were, you know, in old newspaper clippings or things like this, but no one was really creating all the stuff, you know, all the, all the, all the, all the time. You know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, they were, they were just kind of this nerding out on this this stuff in general. And we were, in the meantime, we were writing blog posts and we were, you know, pulling images off of Flickr and putting together top 10 lists and things like this for our content. But um, no one was really applying kind of contemporary design to those things, um, to, the, to the idea of content creation. Um, so that was a bit novel. And so we kind of put those two things together, seeing the appetite for it, and then also saying, 
you know, we can design this content too. We don't, it doesn't just have to be words and pictures and whatever, which sounds obvious now, but no one was really doing it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of identifying that um, and being able to create really engaging visual content was sort of what we became known for and, and infographics specifically kind of in the early days. Mm. And so that was kind of an exciting development and, um, and we generated a lot of, um, you know, interest just based on that kind of capability in the early days. Yeah, you got a very DIY way to sort of like start up a digital agency. That's really fascinating. So do you, so it really was like, I mean, I remember, I remember that time. I myself was doing a lot of infographic design for books and other websites and stuff like that at the time as well. That's really fascinating sort of in, but like people got really excited about like content marketing via infographics. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> fascinating. That's really fascinating. Of course, like Tuffy's like rolling over, like you know, like totally rolling his eyes, <laughs> accuracy of these infographics and all that stuff. But totally. you know, hey, it works. You know, people get excited about that stuff. So yeah, yeah. definitely nice. So so uh, so how long? So you've been Column Five's been around. Like when when was kind of the official start of the agency? Like what did what when you said like okay, we're gonna turn this into like a real business? It's been about ten years now. Is is that right? Uh, yeah, a little more. It was about two thousand nine that we oh, kind of off the ground there and, and started actually doing it with some intention. Yeah. What was one like for the first gigs that you that you had that you actually like, okay, so here's the stuff we're doing it for ourselves and getting some traction. Do you remember some of those first clients that you had that that does some of those first things where you're cutting your teeth as like a we're gonna try and make money doing this kind of you know effort? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of the first was a um, like kind of a uh, it was kind of the Yelp for bars. It was called Slosh Spot, um, which was like, so it was made for some really interesting content, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was one of the first ones that kind of was paying us a paying gig and we were doing it. I think the first kind of legit one um, was Mint.com was one mm -hmm. of our first clients that kind of it was a you know pretty buzzy startup at the time. And they'd come in and we'd we'd really help them build their blog and, and drive a lot of traffic and kind of they became known for their infographics because they were using a lot of interesting like proprietary data and, and those sorts of things. So that was one um, kind of our, you know, our first like big legit client that ended up leading to a lot of other business because they were sort of well recognized within that startup world. And so it was, yeah. It was yeah, no, yeah, that's really fascinating. I want to come back to the different, you mentioned something really interesting there about like, just like the different channels. And I think it was one thing that like people weren't thinking about. And I think even now we're just finally kind of ramping up to, which is thinking about their presence across all these different channels and having, you know, like I said, like applying like really deliberate, consistent design thinking, design, you know, design uh, designs kind of across all those channels. But mm -hmm. like, like, I want to come, like, I'm going to put a pin in that for a second. So like, and, and talk about just kind of the, the explosion in these, in this, you know, the sort of digital content landscape, you know, like mm -hmm. the past 10 years, um, you know, like, all right, so you've got, you know, everything from, you know, all these sort of social websites, you've got video sites and blog sites and podcasts and like, I mean, in anywhere you want to be like, like that's the audience is there to, to be found. So like, how, how have you, how have you changed and adapted over time kind of your strategy as, Again, more and more people have sort of like come in, and then all these different channels has exploded over time. Yeah, but that's a good question. Here is still kind of the same approach, right? I, I think it's had to evolve quite a lot, and I think that's something Asher will be able to speak well to as yeah. sort of someone who who really heads up our strategy and kind of distribution practice. But yeah, it's changed a lot because, as I mentioned in those early days, that um, you know a lot of the thing the channels that we were working through were were established on some of those sites where there was traffic or, or people, a lot of people um, congregating and, and digesting their news there and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that certainly exploded into um, a lot of other things and some have gone away and some of, you know, there are new channels and new social media sites and, and all that all the time. So it really has become much more um, complex and nuanced and there's both a lot more opportunity as well as a lot more sort of competition for attention mm -hmm. and i think that means yeah, sure. it's, it's really important as well as well as some of the, the formats and things have become less novel so it has to be good you know it's not it's not just new um so you really have to have you know authentic message and something that is uh, useful or truly entertaining or um those sorts of things and it has to be delivered in a very like authentic way so yeah um, yeah 
Yeah. 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 To add to that, yeah, I think I think when Ross mentions novelty, I think that's actually an interesting part of it. Actually, that part of ex expanding your capabilities and actually expanding your horizons. Um, I probably say it's like creative hunger. You know that when I first started, we were pretty much still focused on infographics in like 2013. Um, and we first got, you know, some of our first motion graphics and that felt like a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And so many of our creative people were like, what's next? You know, like, let's do like some live action and let's go, let's, we can build a website. I bet if we try our, you know, try hard enough. Um, and just expanding our portfolio in my early days was like huge in itself. Um, and it, I think it just was driven a lot from people who, um, who wanted to do more kinds of work and expand their skill set and find new ways, you know, find, create the next awesome thing that's going to be published by Mashable or Upworthy or whatever. Um, and we got to a point where I think we had to, we were pretty good at most things. And by the way, to, to get there, usually you fail on a, on a lot of projects, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think often it's with a trusted partner who you have to be like, we haven't done this before, but we, you know, we know we can do this. We've seen enough of these. We have the basic components, you know, that we can think of. And there's always going to be surprises with those new projects, I think. But um, we got to a point with, I think, pretty much every work type that lives online at this point, um, where we can do them pretty well. And there's the occasional surprise, you know, but um, I, it's interesting to me to think, to think in those days. Now we're trying to put everything together holistically and say, like, what's the big story, right? I think we'll get to some of that. But um, it really comes from within in a lot of ways because you just have you, you have to have people willing to take some of those risks and people who are kind of ambitious in the way they want to tell a story too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have, finding clients that are willing to take those risks, right, is always a, is always a challenge. You know, it's really fascinating. So you, as you showed saying, this is sort of trial and error because I, I imagine that like being good at this takes a, a a real kind of depth of knowledge or at least depth of experience like with these platforms and with these contexts, right? Like any design is really defined by its context. And so, you know, how do you take a brand and and you know, morph it and change it while staying consistent across all these different channels? I mean, you talk about sort of the, maybe the challenges and the complexities of solving those kind of problems. Yeah, it sounds really overwhelming and daunting when you when you talk about it kind of top down in that way, <laughs> I think. I think, you know, when you, when, what I would rather, the way I'd rather think about it, just because it's less stressful, frankly, but, um, <laughs> but also, you know, I think it leads to a better result that's a little more measured is actually starting at the bottom. So starting with um, who, who is our audience, right? It's pretty basic, pretty basic question. It's not always an easy answer. Yeah. And maybe there's, you know, in my world, we talk about personas a lot. Um, maybe there's like several segments we need to account for. So. How do we put those all alongside each other and then figure out how to build on top of that, right? And is there a message? Is there a priority audience? If so, we can kind of lean one direction. Is do we need to speak broadly across several audiences? In that case, we need to like look at everything at once um, and and but take it chunk by chunk. So um, it's interesting when Ross talks about the the earliest days of Column Five and and how do we get something on Dig uh, first page? How do we get something on Reddit that's going to do well first page, um, that can be a pretty successful approach. Actually, you know, not necessarily those channels um, for a lot of our clients, but getting to know your audience in a way that's not just this is like Cindy Shopper or whatever you know, and she's forty two, and but where does she hang out? What does she drink? What is she? What especially what is she actually like? Right? Um, and what are you know? Can we get inside her brain as much as possible? And then do that across all the people we need to speak to, mm -hmm. and try to figure out what the commonalities are and where the segmented, segmented um, approaches need to come from. So, then you start to put together kind of building, you know, building blocks, so to speak, and and then you come out with something when you start to go into the ideation process. Everything I've just talked about is kind of usually my domain of so let's set up the brief for the creative teams uh, as a strategist. Um, and after that, it's like we have a pretty good framework for if we have ideas, um, whether it's a format idea or like a really cool video, you know, standalone video idea or or a tagline or, you know, a top message, then we can put everything in together again and say this is probably going to work across or it's not going to work for some reasons because um, we can almost think about it like a pyramid of 
of complexity where mm -hmm. the bottom is all those little components. And then we have that bigger um, item on the top. Well, you know, it's really fascinating that as, as you're sort of speaking, it, it makes me think that like, that designers now really have to think a little more deeply about the brand and like what it stands for and how best to express it, right? Because you're really thinking in a much more nuanced way. Like I need to speak to these people on this channel in this way, you know, slightly tweaked here. There's this nuance there sort of addressing kind of like who they are and what they're interested in. And as opposed to a different channel, how do you again think about the how how do these other sort of elements of the brand kind of express in this different way? It seems like a really fascinating problem in a way in which, like uh, again, like I mean, I, this is kind of funny. One of my first jobs was like people just walking in off the street and saying, "Give me a logo," right? Like there's not really a chance in that moment. Like people are just like thinking about the logo as this like the you know, almost like service side, just slap it on there, it does its job, and like they're not thinking about it any deeper than that, you know, and so. Here you're really selling something to to a client, saying like we're going to think about your brand in these really deep and nuanced ways. I mean, like has that is that an easy sell, or is that something that you're still finding that you have to convince people of? Really good question, uh, and I'll, I'm curious to hear Ross's opinion too. But the fact is, I think we still do compete with those shops that are willing to take people off the street. You know, yeah. they it's a different mindset, but. Um, a lot of clients will look at our price point um, and it's not the person on the street's price point mm -hmm. um, or 99 designs type of community where literally $99 for like 50 logo options. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's not how like an, a good internal culture is going to be built uh, at an agency. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's kind of the work we've been doing over the last probably five, six years now in creating more of a brand strategy practice. Mm -hmm. um, asking a lot of those questions that we need to ask. A lot of clients are not going to be ever convinced. Um, you know, that's, yeah. we have to figure out on the, on the very, in the very early process of, you know, our, our contract directors talking to those people and people kind of qualifying leads, frankly, um, if they're kind of serious about what, what a brand can be. Um, some people are bought in, some people are kind of curious and we can do some education there. Um, uh, actually, I, I think that our blog, just to give a quick plug, is a great starting point where we can, even with some newer people to our agency, we can um, send them some resources and say, here's kind of, here's why, um, here's some tools to get you started even. Um, we're happy to pick it up after that. But yeah. it's kind of, you know, it's case by case, obviously. But then you have people come in um, from really kind of inspired brands and are right on the same page as us and thinking about, you um, you know, they're usually not going to be asking us for a logo because that's really well dialed already. But they're at least we're ready to have those conversations um, on that level and help us understand the why of all of it uh, right away uh, instead of us kind of coaching them into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of if I can add to that. Yeah. I, th I think Ashley touched on education a couple of times, which is like whether we're doing that through co the content on our own blog, which we get a lot of people that are kind of coming and using those materials and understanding you know, the way that we think about it, which is um, just one way to think about it. But <clears throat> I think, um, you know, increasingly that's why we've gotten more into, uh, gone from a place of just creating content to developing our strategy practice because all those things mm -hmm. ultimately ladder up um, yeah. all the way up to your, you know, your purpose and your values and your principles as an organization. And in order to create kind of authentic and meaningful content, it has to start there. And so, like Asher said, some of our clients certainly get that. And we that's kind of where we start. And we're working with them to fill in gaps in that thinking. And maybe they have a lot of really good thinking already and that's established and we're just sort of building off of that. Um, but in some cases, we're helping them develop that or to fill in gaps in that to be able to create a foundation on which we can start to create content that feels real and mm -hmm. feels uh, meaningful and it's helpful and it's actually connecting with those people. Because if there's sort of that, there isn't that through line, it's going to, people feel that viscerally, right? You feel yeah, when sure. something's off. It's, it's the same with any brand sort of idea. It's like, it's going to feel, um, inauthentic. And I think that's the big shift that you're talking about with, you know, just getting a logo as a one-off thing or whatever. It's the same. Um, if your content is disconnected 
from that, it's going to, uh, it's just not going to resonate yeah. at all. So. Yeah. And I think, I think we found it, we were feeling it too. I think that's kind of where this all started from was, yeah. um, I've mentioned all the projects we started to create and feel like we could actually do. And then we kind of shifted from like, Oh my God, we can do this to why are we doing this? <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it's from, you know, and, and sometimes I don't really want to ask that question. Cause they're like, let's make a cool video about like a clown car and, you know, on a freeway or something. And we're like, cool. Like we're totally in, we'll get to those <laughs> questions later. Uh, Cause it just sounds cool. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, you know, B2B content marketing, it, we, it, a lot of times things feel like we're checking boxes or it did for a long time um, yeah. there. And, um, you know, we start to ask ourselves a creative team, why are we doing this again? What are the goals? Who are we trying to reach? Sometimes those answers weren't available. Um, and at some point it has to, those conversations have to happen. It, some, I think we are finding so often that they're happening um, in the feedback stages, right? So we'd mm -hmm. get, we deliver around one of that project and then our clients are starting to tell us, this is, of course our clients are great now, but this is before. Uh, and um, th they would start to tell us like, well, the, you know, this isn't reaching our main objective, which is X. And we're like, where did that come from? You know, like we should have known about, we should have known about those, these elements long before. Um, and our brand stands for this. And then when you, when you see, even today, I see sometimes brands don't have certain elements of their, of their brand strategy um, defined. And there's a lot of ar arguments and a lot of um, misalignment on the client side, which leads to just them, them having a really, really expensive blog post because they can't get, you know, we, we didn't start out with a solid brief because there's no brand foundation and they end up spending like six to eight grand or something for us to write 800 words when it, you know, it should have been far, far easier um, mm -hmm. if we had that initial context. Uh, it's, I mean, so I have, I have a, that actually got me a completely different train of thought, but I want to, I'll go, I'll come back to that in a second. I wanted to so talk about the, like the story that you're telling is this one of like, you know, as you're working, like continue to sort of, you know, iterate on and think about what you're doing and kind of like mature and kind of like level up kind of your story and like your, your offering really. Like, have you seen on the flip side, have you seen, you know, as we've all been, you know, become more uh, aware of and more savvy, you know, of these platforms, like has the has the clientele changed as well? Are the things that they're coming to you and asking for, like, again, have you seen a, a better awareness of that? Or or are they still just looking for like the quick gimmick, like meme worthy sort of like, just boost these numbers? Or you know, have you seen a change in the client side as well? I think there's definitely an increased sophistication. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think people understand the sort of em emptiness of some of that stuff that existed 10 years ago, which yeah. was just like create a viral video, but there's nothing behind it. Mm -hmm. um, nothing mm -hmm. that that's connecting to, or, I mean, and some of that is just a sophistication and understanding that content marketing isn't just about traffic. Like it's about an end objective. It's about a business objective ultimately, which is, you know, building an audience or ultimately, you know, conversion of whatever the, the product is or something like that. So, yeah. um, or just being useful and supporting that, um, building sort of brand equity that way. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that people are, I think clients have gotten more sophisticated in making sure that that's tied to something, but I, I do think they come kind of across the spectrum of you definitely find people who, um, want something because they want it, um, or they have a, maybe a misguided idea of what needs to be created. Um, but I think increasingly it's definitely, uh, the whole industry has evolved and I think, you know, on the brand side as well. Yeah. You know, there's something you said there about, you know, brands building up equity that, that just boosting the numbers, then having people kind of see through it, you know, like, and you know, the, I think of the fellow kids meme a little bit, you know, like, like, you know, people are like, Oh, you're trying to, Tell, talk to me in my language, I can see right through you. Like instead, they're really trying to create a connection and a relationship, right? That's going to be ongoing. They know that like, we're gonna, that this is something that's not just sort of the shallow engagement. And that that, that feels like something that, that's really changed. Uh, and I like that you were sort of, you know, highlighting that. I mean, can you think of any, like any recent projects where, um, you know, that, that, that you've done, that you can speak to that, that, that tells that more holistic, more nuanced story. It's something that you were able to really sink your teeth into as an agency, you know, and really produce something that you felt proud of and that, that really achieved the objectives and goals for, for the client. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I think some of our work with um, more purpose-driven organizations comes to mind first. I think um, uh, what's on my mind is um, the, it's now called the Othering and Belonging Institute, but this is like a research uh, institute in Berkeley, actually kind of adjacent to Berkeley University or University of Berkeley or whatever it's called. Um, uh, and they, they've they actually been kind of this think tank for some of our very modern kind of social studies concepts. Um, and so, you know, they're not, they're not Microsoft, um, you know, doing a really, a really uh, kind of altruistic brand um, campaign necessarily. They, they already started starting at a point from like heavy purpose, heavy sense of kind of um, uh, fulfilling like a societal need, but working on that kind of that, that work, I think, and helping kind of tell these very heady concepts um, in, in moving motion graphic formats. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it doesn't get, it's a very, very pure example of that, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. That sounds fascinating. That that sounds really. I'm gonna have to look that part project up. So, um, so I mean, do you? Uh, I was gonna say like, how how are you? There's one thing I've been really thinking about lately, which is like you know analytics is like how we use data to inform our design decisions. And this is a little little bit of a tangent, but it's something that again like I'm sort of been thinking about. But like this is like a lot of the work that you were just speaking about is about trial and error. It's like what works on this this platform and how do we connect with people? Like what kind of tools do you use? Is it, is it is still that kind of trial and error or are you using kind of other tools to sort of you know think about trends or think about you know personas? Uh, I don't know anything in there that might be useful for people to go and look up and, and think about if they're you know following similar lines of work uh, as as you. Anything there? Yeah, I mean we we actually recently we've we've tried a few tools I think and we've gotten mixed results from them. Um, with a lot of like the the profiling tools, I think like social listening tools and um, one other ones that they tend to pull from social for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's a little bit, it's like, you know, sold as like a turnkey thing and you're, you're pulling from this big data set. There's some issues with data quality, I think there. Um, sure. And we've, to some extent, you know, it's, it's nice to get some context from some of those tools. I think for the most part, we tend to include them in a wider, wider kind of pool of data that we have and wouldn't make like big decisions based on just what they're telling us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think the last couple of years we've we've just gotten a little simpler about it and said, um, we, you know, do you have access to some of your customers we can talk to? And yeah. it really helps us just get, uh, first of all, just put a face to the people we're selling to. Um, mm -hmm. But we can really dive deeper into some um, some issues with them, and it's not just you know what did they tweet about more often than you know the next person. But what do they really care about? What motivates them, um, and what you know? What are they afraid of, honestly? Uh, and what kinds of what kinds of media do they consume? Kind of the three three areas I tend to look for. From there, um, you know, analytics are always a, a, a good a great learning, obviously. So whenever we're deploying campaigns, we're looking early and often at um, results and trying to get a feel for what did work there uh, or what did not, um, and and kind of get smarter as we go on. I think it's important just to note too, like when, when a, we, we typically start with a strategy engagement, quote unquote. Um, and so we'll set up our team to then go produce content, but we never see that strategy as like done. It's like we, yeah. we have a strategist who's embedded with the account and we keep, you know, the, the re results reporting that we do ongoing, we bring it back into the strategy document um, and try to keep it as much of a living document as we can. So. Um, so a lot of times the market is the best place you get insights from, um, actually sending work out there and seeing, seeing what happens. Sure. I, thanks for sort of digging into that. You know, I think there's this perception that, you know, particularly in tech, that like these analytics are sort of the sort of turnkey, the sort of solution for everything. It's like, oh, well, you know, like we can just sort of see the numbers and see if this works or that works. And it's like, well, no, it's, it, it really, and this is why I like about it because it speaks to the importance of design and what a designer brings to the table, which is taking into account, you know, all the different factors from the analytics, all the 
of the quality of research. And, you know, it's not one of these things that's solving your problems, but it's really the holistic approach. And I think that really speaks to your process. And I, I really like uh, you kind of expanding on that. So thanks. That was a little bit of a tangent, I know, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I would. Great point. I think I think I have kind of a I have sort of a hot take on that. I think, which is that I I think people shouldn't get too carried away with this like data idea. I mean, we're a data visualization yeah. agency. Um, yeah. I, we love data. We love to tell stories with it. Um, there's a lot of value in it. Um, I also see, I also see people who, who are letting data be like the, the everything, right? And so, um, for me, you know, I've had discussions with a lot of different creative directors about this, and and try to formulate like what's the right way to think about this. And I think in the end of the day, it's like co-piloting like mm -hmm. um, data with creative. And I I like to think that like. Nike didn't test their way into just do it or didn't test their way into some of these mind blowing designs that they have been famous for. Um, you know, they, they might've produced a prototype and then seen how it went, but you can't, you can't build the whole ship, you know, mm -hmm. data point by data point. And I think you have to have some instinct, you know, telling a story and, and having a good sense of story. And I, by story, I mean, not just written, but visual as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, at some point, trusting your instincts and being willing to be wrong as well um, uh, are, I think you have to think of all that stuff together, which is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that speaks too to the, the fundamental shift that's happened, I think, between sort of the era of advertising into this era of content is mm -hmm. content is not, uh, and, and brand is not a facade the way that it was before, right? It was, that was just, a, I'm going to say a message and a tagline and, and see how it resonates and, and how it converts. And I think that this becomes, content becomes much more about human to human interaction from within the brand to within you know, the audience or the, the customer base. And I think you're talking about real, real people talking to real people and mm -hmm. sharing real and useful messages to each other. And I think that's what, I, I think that shift is really exciting. Um, but like Asher said, yeah, you want to do things that are useful and you want to be able to measure those things, but you ultimately, it needs to be uh, a human to human connection. It's not just which messages, um, you know, test the best and that's how we're going to create our whole marketing strategy. Yeah. That's a great point, Ross. You know, I think a lot of brands probably learned the hard way that these are person to person connections. Like these aren't this sort of like you know, this odd that the, the brand or you know, the company itself you're gonna hide behind that and like well mm -hmm. you know we're maybe doing things maybe that aren't great kind of behind the scenes but this brand mm -hmm. is protecting this idea of who we are and now because of that person to person connection across all these channels like people can see right through that they can just poke that you know with a pin and then I'll, you know just deflate yeah. completely so that's a great yeah, point. Like a accountability there yeah um, between accountability great words him right that's really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. That's a great point, Ross. Thanks for thanks, thanks for going with me on that tangent. I really like the points the two of you made on that one. So thank you. Uh, so you know, let's let's put a pin in that for a second, and I want to talk about like the team and the organization because I think you can like bolt as you know both you know creative leaders of course Ross is the co-founder you know like part of any successful business is not just of course the clientele and keeping the doors open, but it's about how you build a team in an organization. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, let's take a minute to sort of talk about that. You know, you talked about um, kind of in, in our previous conversations about, you know, your passion around designing an organization, designing mm -hmm. a team. Um, you know, expand about that a little bit more. What, yeah. what excites you about that? Like I said, you came from this very DIY, we're just doing it for ourselves. And you sort of get some clients in the, you keep the door open, you're making some money, but now you're like, well, now we have people coming to us for work. We've got to have a team here. So. Now it becomes about the 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 the, the, work, the role and the the job changes a little bit for for you and, yeah. and your leadership team. Yeah, right. it, I think it does, and I think in some ways it doesn't. Like I, I have a lot of people ask me that because um, I was very you know very hands on and, and close to the work, obviously in the early days doing you know some of the early design to very poorly, but um, I was I was doing, um, but then you know moving. Uh, as, as the team grows, needing to, um, you know, sort of scale your processes and your practices and your tools and all these sorts of things. And so you get into a more like operational, like businessy sort of role. Um, and I think people 
I think that's a big shift for a lot of people, but I, I didn't feel that for myself. Like for me, that's still design. It's still creative. Yeah. It's still a challenge where you're figuring out systems, um, mm -hmm. you know, not with pixels, but with um, people with tools and spaces and things like that. And I think that's what really excites me about that is that it's, um, it's, it's such a dynamic system that you're trying to help figure out. Um, and ultimately kind of what drives me there is like how, how to get creative people to work together the best to, mm -hmm. to achieve their full potential, to create great work, to be ultimately really fulfilled in what they're doing. Um, I think it is super important. And, and that's not just about creating a cool workplace with ping pong tables, but I think it's more about sort of achieving a degree of mastery over what you're doing. And I think we can only do that in collaboration with each other mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, by giving each other feedback and having these sort of dynamic systems of, of creativity coming together. Um, and so figuring out the best way to, to do that is, is a really interesting challenge for me. And I think um, I'm certainly, we are certainly on that, on that journey of, of trying to figure that out, but, but ultimately kind of getting to a place where people are empowered to, uh, to experiment with their own way of working in order to, and then to make decisions about their own ways of working in order to, to sort of optimize that is, mm -hmm. is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I, I love how you described that, 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 that there is this, this is a design challenge, um, you know, de designing process, designing collaboration around people. And that's been also like a fascinating sort of journey for myself as well. What are some of the recent like things that you've done with the team to really try and help that both, you know, foster collaboration, but give people the autonomy that they need to feel like they're really, you know, owning something or contributing at a really high level. Talk about anything, anything mm -hmm. that comes to mind? Yeah, for sure. There have been a few things in recent years that we've done. Um, one was uh, we adopted sort of a modified version of Agile um, to run our, our agency processes, which has been really interesting. And, and we've sort of adapted um, that over time to, to serve us. And I think that was a shift in, um, you know, really giving more power to our creatives to define and to understand and to take ownership over the work that they're doing, um, you know, rather than it just being something that was like tasked um, to them to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that has been a good, a good shift and, and still certainly kind of a work in progress. Um, you know, another thing is we've, we've, <laughs> this is kind of a, maybe on the nerdy or boring side, but we've recently implemented like a new project management system and, and in mm -hmm. any shift like that, brings about a lot of um, questions to the surface, right? About how we work, about how we want to do things and how we want to collaborate together, that both within the system, but you know, just in general. Um, so I think that has been really interesting and sort of foundational in my thinking about understanding the limitations of sort of trying to centrally design the perfect, elegant process, which I think I've idealized in the past mm -hmm. and understanding that um, that's probably not going to happen and it, and it needs to be more decentralized than that. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be um, very experimental and very iterative by the people that are actually experiencing those challenges or those questions and being able to, um, you know, think of it sort of like as a learning and growing organism of tests and experiments where we're iterating and finding better ways to work together rather than trying to kind of centralize that and figure out the one best thing that works for everyone and then um, putting it out there. So I think that's been a, a shift and sort of a transition that we're in right now is uh, figuring out how to do that well. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is, there is to have a process or on, right, like a team or an organization because you have this perception that's going to achieve our results, right? But like you're saying, like it's a living organism, like the dynamics between people and the dynamics with people and the projects they're working on, like can shift and change and being open to that, like seems very progressive to me in a, in a way that like, um, you know, feels, I don't know, interesting and new and not something that's just like, here, this is the process that worked at 
this place over here. Yeah. Thus, we're going to just sort of adopt it wholesale and expect the same results. Right? But there's this, this is the thing that we're going to learn from and change over time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, yeah, yeah, I think to 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 bridge that with some of Ross's point about decentralization. I think when things do change and when things are irregular, you you want people to feel that flexibility and the and the autonomy to 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 deal with it, right? To make decisions, to take the risks. You know, th to, every decision is a risk at some point, but um, to be able to feel comfortable there, I think if you create a culture where it's it's more rigid, you know, you have people asking, what do I do in this situation? What do I do in this situation? Um, this just happened, like, what should I do? Or, you know, it just starts to drain drain from management too. Um, the time, you know, obviously we're here to support, but I think finding the right air, the right mode of working where people feel like, you know, if they make a mistake, they won't be chastised and it won't be like, you know, job threatening situation, but it's something to learn from every time. Um, that's, I think that's something that's helped us become more fluid in the way we attack our work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so on that front, like on some of that, you know, giving, empowering people, um, like what, particularly in this time when we've all been working sort of remotely, like what what kind of benefits do you see like, that it really helped empower people, give them kind of more power, more ownership, you know, closer to maybe the challenges they're facing? Like, what, do, you, do you have any like tips or any things that you've tried, things you've seen that, that have a little bit of success in that? Because you know, right now I know that that's a thing that I've struggled with even myself, is just feeling every day that I'm, I, I feel like I, could, I know what I, could, I should be doing and I'm motivated to go and do it. And then thus I can feel like, you know, I have the support of the people around me, even though, you know, I'm not looking into them and like you're reaching over the, you know, the desk to the other side. Like what are some things that you've been trying and doing in this time in helping people mm -hmm. feel empowered and to do their work? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of it is what Asher talked about in just making sure that there's sort of space for mm -hmm. failure and, um, and, embracing and supporting the fact that that we can try things and it's okay if they don't work out. Um, I think that we, one of the things that I've been thinking about and kind of working on that front is thinking about what's sort of a, what's our, what's our decision-making process? Like what are our sort of decision-making rights, which I think we've had sort of a lack of clarity on in the past. And we've tried to, to work on that in a few different ways, but, um, one of those shifts is moving from an idea of we're pretty kind of um, transparent and inclusive culture, but um, without being explicit about who's in charge of something or who's making a decision on something, that that can kind of just default to either um, people assuming that consensus needs to be come to, which is really mm -hmm. hard with 50 people to all come to the exact same decision, or, mm -hmm. um, or it falls back into sort of invisible power dynamics, right? Of hierarchy or of, you know, the loudest voice in the room and that sort of thing. And so I think it's more about um, coming to uh, sort of an agreement about how we can run experiments. So like what's kind of a lightweight decision framework to where people can buy in and consent to something and say like, I think that's safe to try. Like, I think I'm not, um, I might not agree with it. That might not be what I would do, but like, I think it's okay to try. Yeah. And, and I think that's the shift from going like, everyone has to agree with this thing to like, um, no one disagrees or objects strongly to this. And mm -hmm. so we can, we can just do it and see what happens. And as long as we have some degree of diligence around follow up and measurement and the time horizon of those things, then, then we can have a structure behind saying, did it work? Did it not? How might we change yeah. going forward? And that makes it a lot easier, I think, and less daunting to introduce a change or to suggest a, a shift. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not too dissimilar from why strategy is important for client work. It's just setting, it's aligning at the right points, right? It's yeah. Yeah. what are we trying to do here? There's a million ways to try to do to try to do that and get it done, but at least you can agree on what you want to see happen. And then when you actually try things, you can look back and say, did that work? And hopefully you have people who are um, mature and kind of sober about it enough to to admit when things 
um, went wrong and just see that as a learning every time. Yeah. And I mean, all that right built on that foundation of trust. I mean, something I've talked about a lot with my own teams of like, if we can all trust one another, we can all feel like we're sort of like designing with a safety net, right? And that safety mm -hmm. net is that support structure that we have of being designers and creatives all sort of working together and supporting one another, right? Like at the end of the day, like that leads to the best work. People taking, feeling that they can take chances, they can fail and they can learn from that and try and try again the next time. So mm -hmm. it's great to hear. Uh, so we we got a few minutes left here. I was wondering. Uh, I always like to sort of ask this because it's something that you know I'm always looking for myself. Like, what is what's keeping you inspired right now? What are the things that helping you stay creative? You know, in this time when again, I know a lot of my creativity I'm sort of finding was really relying upon the people around me, the people I would bump into every day. And so without that, I'm like, hmm, what's going to keep me? What's going to keep me inspired and excited to do my work? So I'm going to throw that to both of you so I can learn a little bit. And so. He steals some ideas. So. Yeah. You know, Asher, you want to go first? Yeah, I bet Ross is probably a better answer than me, so I don't want to go after him. Uh, it might sound cheesy, but I really do believe that um, inspiration comes from literally everything. Um, yeah. And I think before last year, I would just, my answer would be like traveling was the number one thing for me. Like, same. A quick anecdote on that is just. Um, our our agency positioning is or tagline or um, kind of brand message is best story wins, and that came from me being caught in a crazy monsoon in Thailand and um, and kind of taking shelter with this Irish guy who is like at the end of the day, person with the best story wins. Referring to um, referring to like why he he was he he had been traveling for like two or, two or three years or something, and I was like wow, and just kind of catching up with him and we're it's kind of a surreal moment with like. It's just pouring, and um, that became our agency tagline. So, literally, you know, I, didn't, I haven't billed yet for that work uh, from all the years ago, but um, I don't think I would have come up with that just sitting in a conference room or sitting at home. I will plug my my super secret kind of blog I refer to for um, kind of media ad creative inspiration. It's called the Denver Egotist. Um, it's kind of a low key blog, um, but they have. They really, they really mine deeply for all the new media out there and s small projects and big projects alike. So when I'm trying to prepare for a brainstorm or something, um, I just take a look at that and it always gives me some fresh thinking. Nice, exciting. All right, well, thanks for sharing your super secret blog. I am definitely going to yeah. So Ross, how about you? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, a few things. I think uh, I don't, I don't digest a lot of content kind of on the web. And I, a part of that is I've been, you know, trying to be super intentional about how I sort of cultivate my own attention and make sure that I have a good amount of empty space to be bored and to think and that sort of thing, yeah. um, which is difficult with, with two little kids running around the house, but mm -hmm. uh, it, <laughs> it, uh, you gotta make some space. I think a couple of things I've enjoyed recently in thinking more about the like team dynamics and um, org design and that sort of stuff, I really enjoyed um, that series on Netflix about the 90s Chicago Bulls, The Last Dance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all have seen it, but I thought it was a really interesting, really interesting to see team dynamics and, and sort of uh, Phil Jackson's like coaching zen. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I just I found it both like inspiring and, and also um, interesting in thinking about those areas of like autonomy and um, and like empowerment of your team and how the players interacted with each other, I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, the other thing I'm reading right now is a book called, or actually I just finished uh, a book called Brave New Work that I really enjoyed um, that talks about a lot of these principles of sort of organizational design. It's by uh, an author named Aaron Dignan. Um, and they have a podcast as well that I've really, I've really liked. And I think it's it, looking at a lot of those more progressive ways of um, working and sort of calling into question uh, the status quo and how some of those things, uh, what is in place and how does it serve us and how we might rethink those things to to organize in more um, kind of thoughtful and, and human-centered ways. Right. So, right. Yeah. I'm definitely going to check that out. Yeah, the Bulls series was really awesome. So thank you both. This was such a pleasure. Like I said, like my favorite part is being, uh, working at Adobe is being able to talk to other amazing creatives like yourselves. And uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Great conversation, guys. Thanks. So Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Thank you, Asher. That was awesome.
lots of great comments yeah. in the chat pod about um, how valuable the conversation was. So thank you. Yeah, um, for you sharing so authentically. Of course. Yeah, it was a great conversation. A great conversation. A couple just very quick highlights. Um, Asher, I love the notion around sort of data as a co-pilot uh, to like problem solving and creative instinct. You know, we get too caught up on you know data is going to have the answers for us, and I mean, in a lot of ways, that would just take all the fun out of the creative process and the messiness. Mm -hmm. Any anyway. In, in Ross, I love this, you know, idea of like the beauty of designing an organization, um, but how challenging that can be because um, it's so dynamic and, you know, partially because people talk back to you um, and pixels don't, <laughs> which again is the beauty of that process. So thank you, Talon, Asher and Ross for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation and we, we appreciate the time um, and the perspective. Yeah, Thanks for having us. So Thanks. So thank you everyone um, on LinkedIn for joining us today. As a reminder, the SOTA series live is a collaboration between the Society of Digital Agencies, SOTA, and the Adobe XD team. You can access more articles and interviews on um, XD Ideas. There is a perspective series called SOTA series. So check us out there. We'll drop that in the chat pod for you. And um, join us on June 10th for our next Soda Series live conversation, same time, 10 p.m. Eastern with um, Andy Titus, who's the managing partner and head of product design at Free Association. So we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, thanks everyone. Have a, have a great afternoon, morning, evening, uh, wherever you're calling in from, we'll see you soon. <laughs>